Welcome to the Living in Alignment podcast. My name is Amy Landry. Through a collage of conversations, here we distill mindful living and timeless wisdom within a modern, everyday context. Thank you for being here. Jeevana Heyman is the founder and director of Accessible Yoga, an organization dedicated to increasing access to the yoga teachings and supporting yoga teachers. He is the author of Accessible Yoga, Poses and Practices for Every Body, Yoga Revolution, Building a Practice of Courage and Compassion, and The Teacher's Guide to Accessible Yoga, Best Practices for Sharing Yoga with Everybody. His books, classes, and trainings support yoga teachers and yoga therapists in finding ways to bring creativity and collaboration into their teaching while still respecting the ancient yoga tradition. Welcome, Jivana. It is such a delight to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for being with me. Ah, Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here and to talk to you, Amy. So thanks for the invitation. Yeah, absolutely. As we always do here on the Living in Alignment podcast, I'd love to begin with a brief overview of your story. And obviously people in your community and who have read your books, they'll have a little bit of insight into this, but I really think your story particularly informs the work that you are doing today and the books that you are writing and how you're serving the yoga community. So would you take us through that overview of your story, how you came to yoga, to teaching and the realm of specifically advocating for greater accessibility in our community? I think, one of the main things I like to share is that I, I learned yoga from my grandmother when I was a young child, that she was just incredible and she was a real seeker. Um, you know, she'd had just some really interesting experiences in her life and was always like looking and yeah, like a spiritual seeker. And she had, she was here in California and she studied with um, Jay Krishnamurti and Swami Satchidananda who, and he became my teacher later. So it was just like, that was definitely my entryway. In fact, m- literally my earliest memories, uh, I was just writing about this, uh, are being with her during her morning practice. Cause it was just so weird that she'd be like standing on her head, you know, and I just remember, I think I was around four years old and I could picture her standing on her head. I just think that was so funny. Um, so yeah, that was the beginning, but then I didn't really continue until, um, let's see, I was in my twenties and uh, I'm a gay man and I, I was, you know, just came out in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and I was living in New York and then in San Francisco. And it was just overwhelming. And so I was just, I was struggling so much personally that I, I went back to yoga just to like survive and deal with my, um, I don't know, that combination of grief and anger that was happening at the time where, you know, I don't know how much you're familiar with that AIDS epidemic in those years. I mean, it was just such a kind of chaotic and challenging time. I had so many friends and boyfriends who got sick and died and, um, you know, it was just hard to be exposed to that uh, at such a young age, although I'm very grateful, you know, because I, I'd say those were my, those were my teachers, you know, the guys that went through that and and shared that experience with me. Um, and anyway, I, I was an AIDS activist at the time and thinking that that would, that would do it, right? Like yelling and screaming on the streets and getting arrested a lot and doing some really, I don't know, just dangerous things. Um, but then it, it kind of shifted at one point, which is a longer story, but I, re- I started to recognize that I was gaining so much from yoga personally. Um, I had found a teacher by that time, it was probably 1990, um, named Kazuko Onodera in Berkeley, California. And she really showed me how to care for myself. You know, she was, she kind of took me under her wing and it was, you know, how like a good teacher can just kind of show you like, not just yoga, not just asana, but like yoga, like big yoga and cooking and meditation and, uh, gardening and caring for myself. And, um, so she really, turned my life around and then I started to see that I could share um I could share that with my community and so accessible yoga really I mean literally came out of that because when I I decided to become a yoga teacher specifically because I wanted to bring yoga to the community of people with HIV and AIDS that I was part of and and that's what I did I mean I, I finished teacher training and like literally started 
HIV AIDS classes in San Francisco through the Integral Yoga Institute and then at the local hospital. Um, and that's really where I also learned that um, what I had been trained to do wasn't really going to work either. You know, that my students didn't want that. I mean, some enjoyed that, but it was like, first of all, they needed adapted practice, but they also wanted philosophy. Like they were hungry for it because they were really going through a spiritual crisis. They wanted to talk about the teachings and that was so exciting for me. Mm -hmm. That was a long, short story. Sorry. I'm impressed, actually. I'm impressed. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's so many significant moments along the way, but what a, what a beautiful uh, seed planted from your grandmother and how that has unfolded and opened over the years, you know, to be doing such significant work, certainly not just, you know, teaching yoga in general, but to be able to really support, support people in a specific way and then share that education and knowledge and insight with the, the wider teaching um, community. It's incredible. So speaking of accessible yoga, instead of taking us through, uh, the insight into what accessible yoga actually is, I'm sure you get asked that a lot, particularly in interviews and so forth. Could you delve into a couple of the main misconceptions that you come across? Like what, what needs to be debunked? Let's say, what are some major misunderstandings about what people think accessible yoga is? Right. I mean, most people think it's just, it's just adapting asana, <laughs> you know, but part of that's because a lot of people think yoga is asana. So that's, you know, it's, it goes along with that misconception that accessible yoga is just making poses available. And that's, that's a part of it. I love that. And I, and I, I mean, that's a lot of what I show on social media because people are interested and, and I teach a lot of that too, because I think it's important. And because a lot of students are looking for that, they're looking for a way into yoga and asana is so great in that way. Um, and I always say, you know, Asana is what makes yoga both inaccessible and accessible at the same time, because it's like, it's so tangible and like practical, but it's mm -hmm. also the vision that we have of it is so inaccessible. There's like fancy poses that most of us can't do. Um, but I would say that's the main, well, that's the main misconception. And what I would say that the other part is that accessibility, it's, it's to me, it's access to the heart of the teachings. That's what accessible yoga really is. It's like trying to get, to the core spiritual teachings that I think all of us are, I think all of us are hungry for, maybe not everyone, but I think most of us are really like, at some point in our lives, um, asking those big questions, you know, like, what am I doing? Like, what's the point of life? And, you know, and then the answers are there for me. Like I, yoga answered all those questions. I mean, I'm still pondering, but I think that's incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the other misconception is that I'm the one who did it. Like, I would just say that I, I get identified with accessible yoga and that's okay. But, you know, there's a long line of incredible teachers that not only trained me, but were doing accessible yoga way, way before me. And uh, I mean, people that I got to know and many before me who I never met. And I just think that's important to say that that's what's so beautiful about yoga is like, this kind of what I think of as like an unbroken line of um, teachers and practitioners, most of whom are unknown, that goes back for literally thousands and thousands of years. And that's just remarkable. Mm. I would also say, at least from my more outsider perspective, I feel like accessible yoga might be considered by some people as being like diluted yoga. Like let's just make it super easy and simple or yeah. um, accessible yoga is chair yoga, you know, which I don't think that that's simple either because chair yoga is not necessarily accessible for people. And if you've seen the way Iyengar used chairs, you might disagree, but I don't know. What do you think about those those suggestions? I, mean, I don't even mind that. I don't mind when people think that I'm diluting it or simplifying because I actually think that there's something really powerful in making something simple. Mm. Like I actually, I do try to do that. I do try to simplify the teachings and, and that, I, I don't think it's the same as diluting them. I actually think it's actually making them more effective and usable. I think that we can overly complicate things and intellectualize and that can be fun, you know, but I don't know if it's so practical. I don't know if it's, I don't know if we can really live yoga if we're doing that. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It has to be, 
to me, these teachings have to be something I can understand and apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, literally, before you said the words, I was thinking simplicity doesn't equate a dilution of a practice. Uh, and if it does mean that there is more accessibility through that simplicity, then actually we're going to move through and, and, and get, as you said, get to the heart much more quickly. And I must say in your book, which I have here, The Teacher's Guide to Accessible Yoga, I was really impressed because you have very clearly advocated for tradition uh, and for upholding tradition and Sanskrit, but in a way that we can go, well, how can I integrate this? And that's really important. Uh, and as I said to you, as we were chatting before the recording, I really think that this is an essential book that everybody needs to read. As a yoga teacher, it should definitely be required reading uh, for anyone that facilitates teaching facilitates teacher training. I'm sure you have a recommended reading list uh, or an essential reading list or required reading list. And I think that this would be a really important one, very pertinent, very relevant to our world today. Uh, and it's written in a way that makes, I know this is going to sound ridiculous, but makes the concepts of accessible yoga accessible, which sounds so silly to say, but it does. And I, oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's really, I think I, it's I really love important. writing. I love writing. And I think communication is at the heart of teaching, actually. Like, I've, I'm definitely a teacher, like, in everything that I do. I think of different formats for teaching. You know, there's, there's like, traditional teaching in person in, like, a yoga class setting. And then there's teaching online. There's teaching through social media. There's teaching through mm -hmm. writing. Right now, like, I really see this as an opportunity to teach. And so when I'm talking to you right now, part of my mind is, like, how can this be helpful for the listener? Because I really want to be teaching and sharing. To me, that's literally what I feel like. I don't want to say burden or responsibility, but I feel like I've been given this great gift and I, I need to share it. Like, mm -hmm. I just cannot keep it to myself. It's just not enjoyable that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's a, it's a duty. It's a call. Yeah. Mm. I love that. And writing and writing is a really great way to teach. I mean, if if someone likes to read, and these days I don't know how many people read books, but hopefully people do. Um, I I actually for a brief time I was a reporter. Actually, I wrote about AIDS um, treatments when I was an activist. That was how I made a living was writing. And so my editors were like the best teachers I could have had because I I went to college, but I really learned about writing when I was doing that. And and I just think it's a really it's a great skill to be, to have and to work on. And I still struggle with it all the time, but it's like, just like teaching, you know, when you're in class and you're trying to come up with the right words, you know, and to say something in the, in a way that is meaningful and um, an efficiency of words and also like effective, mm -hmm. so efficient, and effective use of language. And I feel that way about writing and teaching. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know if you ever feel that when you write something, if it's going to go out in the world and you, especially in the context of writing a book. Um, it's just something I've experienced thinking, oh, I, I don't know if I could just package this up and put it out there because it, I might change my mind on something later or oh that might be okay. irrelevant later. Oh my God. Oh God. I mean, there's so many things I want to go back and change in all my books. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sure that I'll just get worse, you know, over time, but at <laughs> least there's a date on them. And so I can say, well, that's what I thought in that year, you know, um, mm. But yeah, that's that's a little bit of um, the imposter syndrome, you know, also that comes through when you're writing, I think it's just, it's never done. Mm -hmm. And it's always, it's always more to learn and can get better. And I, I'm just trying to, I try to let that go. Mm. You know, I'm mm -hmm. working on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. So in terms of you speak to the, the love of teaching. So let's talk about something that you've mentioned in, in this book. So in the book, you, you say, and you go on to explain it, of course, but ethics create accessibility. So could you tell us what this means and how it is essential on the path, both for students and teachers of yoga? Yeah. I think this is a good example of, of what I was saying earlier about, you know, accessible yoga. It, to me, is like accessing, accessing the heart of the teachings. And to me, ethics are the heart of the teachings. And I would say, I think I do say it in the book that without ethics, you can't really have spirituality at all that all, all spiritual traditions have ethical teachings around them. And that's essential because without that, there's going to be abuse. And also there's a space for the ego to like take responsibility for these incredibly powerful teachings. And that's counterproductive, right? So ethics, if you do practice without ethics, you're, you're actually not 
helping yourself or anyone, to be honest, if that, if that makes sense. And then regarding specifically around accessibility, to me, it just feels like yoga's ethical teachings, especially if you look at the, the yoga sutras, which I know there's more, but that's still the main text we're using, right? Um, if you look at the yamas, they're, you know, ahimsa for me means that everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome. No one feels excluded and left out and injured by the way I'm teaching or conducting myself as a yoga teacher. To me, there's nothing more important than that. Like that, my teaching needs to begin with that. I'm not injuring people. You know, what's the point of that? What's the point of teaching yoga if I'm actually causing harm? I, I don't, I mean, to the best of my ability. Now it might happen without my, I'm sure people have gotten injured in my classes. You know, I know it's just unavoidable at some point, but I'm just saying to the best of my ability, hmm. I want to keep people safe. I want to teach them a practice that is as safe as possible. I should say, and as effective as it can possibly be. And I think that goes along with ahimsa. Also, I'd say with satya, I have to be honest about where the teachings came from, that I didn't make this up. I mean, I think it's such a kind of Western thing to say, you know, to brand it, to even like calling it accessible yoga, I think is kind of an embarrassment because it's like, it's just yoga. And I learned from so many people. And without them, I never would have thought of this. This is not, it hasn't come out of me. I'm teaching it. It's like, I'm just offering my, my version of what I've learned. Mm -hmm. what else can I do? Mm. No, I love that humility. And yeah, I think it's definitely dangerous territory in some sense with social media, because especially with the immense amount of trainings and especially post COVID everything's online, we could easily get like bits of information and then we can just regurgitate it and especially regurgitating it without crediting, but we're regurgitating it also without experience and embodiment of it, letting it assimilate and marinate over time. And, um, you know, that in itself is unethical. Um, but it also yeah. means that we can't really truly teach it. We can just talk about it. We've intellectualized something, but we can't profoundly impact our community and students without that direct experience and embodiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would say I see that a bit. I see, like, when I'm on social media, I can kind of tell which people, which teachers have actually worked with real students, and those that are just kind of in their own world, which isn't, which isn't bad. Like, a lot of people are just teaching from their personal practice only. Mm -hmm. I think that's happening a lot on social media. I think there's a lot of teachers on social media who have a very strong personal practice and that's what they're sharing and to me that's a little different than a teaching practice and I think I've literally had I don't even know how many thousands and thousands of students over 30 years and like this is from them like they they showed me that this, this book is dedicated to my students because they actually taught me what they need and it's just a very different thing I think to become I, and it's been hard through COVID. So I get that newer teachers struggle with this, like to be with people. And I think in person is really powerful to have time working with real people with real issues, physical issues and emotional challenges and spiritual struggles and life stuff. And, and to, cre to create a space that is supportive for them and meaningful that they, that they want to come back to, I think is different than just looking good on social media. <laughs> Definitely. Well, that's not going to last forever, isn't it? So yeah, absolutely. And in your words just now, but also in your book, there's a clear reverence in the way that you speak and write and that you approach your work the, and, the, and the general overarching uh, focus and in, in intent, your mission in, in doing what you're doing. Um, and with that in mind, I'd actually love to read a section from your book that I have in one of your books, obviously, you have multiple, um, but the book that I have in my hands right now. So just bear with me because I think it's really important. So you say accessible yoga isn't about figuring out how to teach 20 different versions of a practice for your 20 students. Rather, it is about learning skills and techniques that allow all 20 students to find their own practice in the midst of a group class. That is an important distinction. There are specific st skills that yoga teachers can learn to make their offerings accessible to everyone. In fact, these techniques 
are typically more effective at achieving accessibility than individually teaching each, each student would be. That's because these skills are about giving students agency and choice. They are about educating them to connect with what they are experiencing and begin to figure out what they need themselves. The process of teaching, providing real education is more about this long-term path than the short-term solution of simply telling everyone what to do. I just love this section. I mean, there's many. I'm sorry if you don't like dog earring, but I dog ear books and there's lots of them in, in your book. That's great. No, that makes me happy. <laughs> Some people hate it. So um, it's like damaging the page, but it, to me, it's like an expression of love. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, this sentence particularly, like because these skills are about giving students agency and choice, which is just like a really potent sentence in all of that. So, um, and that leads in your book to the ABCs of accessible yoga. So, and these are each universal and thereby relevant to any context of teaching yoga. So please share with us your insight into each of these, uh -huh. the ABCs. And if you don't mind, um, if you can just like offer some examples as to how they may show up or, or play out in that yoga class setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so the ABCs does relate directly to that quote about, especially the A is for agency. And so you mentioned that in the quote. And agency is an interesting word that comes from um, sociology. And that's about people having um, decision-making power over their themselves. And so I think it's become more common usage, uh, and especially in yoga these days. And even, I think, with this whole uh, interest in trauma-informed teaching, and I would say that in the end, that is trauma-informed teaching, like giving people agency. But in a way, you can't give someone agency. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's just acknowledging it. So the ABCs, um, well, actually, I have something else, another thought about this. It's kind of interesting to me that I wrote that, like listening to you was interesting because I think I, I also recognize the traditional um, path of yoga or practice is more guru disciple and that you would have not actually, you wouldn't really have agency. <laughs> you actually have a clear teacher that's telling you what to do. And I, I think what I'm searching for in this book and in that description is trying to find a way to bring that into this moment where most of us don't have that in our lives. We don't have this teacher that we can really trust and surrender to. Like, it's just not, I think maybe it's culturally, it's not happening now. Like, I don't know why it's not happening. I mean, there's been so much abuse. That's one reason. Mm. So I guess it's like, I think it's harder for us now without the guru to figure this out ourselves and so i want to say this isn't easy that agency is actually such a core concept it's like it's actually where you would go as a more quote advanced student you know you would actually start to recognize your own needs and um you know be able to practice according to what is effective for you right now so i guess i'm just saying it's a big ask of our students mm -hmm. But I still think that's okay. It's okay to, to know as a teacher where we're headed. And that's, and that's what I'm trying to talk about. The, the agency is about where I'm headed with, with my students. If I had a new person in class, I might not give them a lot of choice right away. I might not just put it all on them. Of course, I would give them choice generally. If something doesn't work for you, if this is uncomfortable or painful, just stop. You know, there's some, I call those disclaimers. There's gonna be a general disclaimer always. But I also, with a newer student, I'm gonna give them such specific and clear practical things to do because there's so much confusion and it's overwhelming. And so when you're newer at the practice, you don't know what you want to do. Or even a lot of people don't know how they feel like they don't even have the connection with with that that interoceptive ability that comes i think later so i don't know if that confuses the situation i just wanted to clarify that i think agency is a big ask and it's a big word um, mm -hmm. it's a fine sort of balance and and you do mention what you just said like later in the book when it comes to language and i think in the lang language section it might have been but um talking about when students are new, like they, they are seeking that guidance. I mean, that's why they're coming to the studio to be taught by somebody. So they're seeking some direction. Um, yeah. And perhaps, but perhaps that is allowing them to have agency. They are consciously choosing. I am yeah. making the choice to come and listen and just 
I trust you as the teacher that you know maybe more about yoga than I do and I'm going to let you tell me what to do until I figure this out myself. Uh, uh, you know, it might be I am I am consciously choosing to seek out a guru and I'm consciously choosing to surrender to them and listen to them. I mean, that's still choice at the end of the day. Yeah. Obviously, that can be abused, definitely. Um, but there is, I think, agency, potential agency in all those scenarios as well. Yeah, that's true. And so maybe it's about recognizing that agency isn't simply um, giving up your role as teacher and saying, well, you do whatever you want. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because I, I do feel that sometimes. I feel that some teachers are just literally just saying to the students, like, do whatever you want. <laughs> or I'm just going to, I'll do my flow and then you follow along. And, you know, that's not, that's not what I'm getting at. You know, it's not about that. It's about, um, it's, it's a dialectic, I always like to say, which is my favorite word, because it's two seemingly opposed truths, which is that on the one hand, everyone has all they need inside. I mean, that's what yoga to say. Like the, the ultimate teaching of yoga is that we have, we are full. All of us are full. And I want to recognize that in everyone who comes to me, even the brand new student, I still see that, that they're full and they're fine. And I'm not going to fix or change them. At the same time, another truth is that, like you said, they're coming to me for yoga and I need to give them instruction. I need to guide them to the best of my ability. I can be as sensitive as possible. I still don't know exactly what they need because I'm not inside of them, right? Like they, they're going to have to make choice. And, um, but I think both of these things are true, that they're fine. And also I'm going to help to direct them. Mm -hmm. Well, it's almost like saying they get freedom within boundaries, like you, you're, you're the teacher creating the safe container, the boundaries, and then they can be free to, to be in, in that That's container. That's the B. So you've gone to the, that's right. That's agents. A is for agency. B is for boundaries. So boundaries is exactly that. So it's, they're, they're bouncing on each other. So there's freedom. And then there's the boundaries. Exactly. Like you said, of their practice, but also I think of the yoga experience. So part of what the B for boundaries is, is like, Okay, as an individual, as an individual student, you can choose to do whatever practice you want. I'm going to give some suggestions, but you can make this your own. At the same time, there's some limitations to that freedom, which is this is a yoga class. You know, mm -hmm. like you can't. I don't want you to harm yourself, and I don't want you to harm anyone else, including me as a teacher. So the boundary is like safety mm. to the best of my ability, and yoga. Like I want this to be time for yoga. Like you're not going to be running around screaming. Well, I don't think like, you know, like if it's time for meditation, don't just get up and jump around. Like this is start doing sun salutations during meditation. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. you don't have to meditate, but you don't, you can't disturb anyone else. Mm -hmm. That's, that's not, that's a good example of a boundary. It's like, so I think that the challenge is the balance of those two things as a teacher is to give people freedom and boundaries at the same time. And it's so hard to do. And so that's the C. So ABC, the C is collaboration. And then that's the answer is that for me, I try to strike up this kind of collaborative relationship with my students. So like, you know, so there's some kind of, there's a lightness to it. And there's a sense of that we're in this together so that it doesn't become ten tense, that there's not a, a battle or a push and pull there. It's like, we're working together. Mm -hmm. There's like a and mutual that, respect. Yeah. And that can look like so many things it could look it can look like a glance of knowing like I see that you're doing your own thing you know what I mean it can be it, it can be subtle it could be really it can be like we need to have a conversation <laughs> like can you talk to me after class like it can be serious like that I mean mm. it could be it could be like okay you need to stop doing that mm -hmm. like that's that's feel safe for me I think I like I've had some really positive experiences when I've had students come to me and say look I have, I've just had this operation or I have this injury just reminding you. So I just love being in your class, but like most stuff I can't do. So I'm just going to go over here. And if you see me doing my own thing, that's fine. And I go, and I think, yes, great. When there's kind of that mutual communication and open communication um, in that context, in that sort of situation, where it's something that of course that they feel comfortable talking about, then it, it is helpful because then we can go, cool, like I've got this boundary, but I know they're there because they just wanna be here in the presence of the group, the community, the space, um, and be guided to some extent, but they're also respecting their body and they're also respecting me as a teacher as well, just by being in communication. Um, but it's also respecting students because they also don't want everybody else thinking, oh, why is she allowed to do 
you know, uh-huh. whatever she wants or why can he do that or whatever. And I think just that open communication can be really communication. valuable. Communication is key, actually. I do talk about that a lot in the book too, because I think mm. communication is, you, you can't teach without that. There has to be clear communication in order mm-hmm. for that to be a teacher-student relationship. And that is a relationship, you know, that we need to honor. Um, it's a really important one that I think is not respected enough. Like it's such a beautiful relationship on both sides. It doesn't need to be any more than that. You know, it can just be that. And it's it's so powerful. I want I have one other thought about it though, around this mm-hmm. BBC is that the challenge I think for yoga teachers is to um, practice non-attachment in order to do that, in order to do the ABCs and to actually be able to provide your students with agency, like to really recognize, and that's really what it is, it's not providing, it's recognizing their inherent agency. And at the same time, create really efficient and useful boundaries, I think depends on, and, and even the collaboration to make it happen depends on this teacher's ability to not be so invested on an ego level that you get caught up in the story. There has to be this like kind of almost like a little distance. And um, I don't know if that people know what non-attachment is. Like, I think we think of it in a really negative way, but in a positive way, like a kind of loving, supervising kind of parental non-attachment of like, okay, I'm here to keep you safe, but I'm not invested in the outcome of this practice for you of this helping you or not or you enjoying this or not like I'm trying I'm not going to invest in that because that that's where I think I lose sight of it and I start it becomes about me as a teacher Mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense I, I suppose that in some sense to me when I listen to you speak that ties back into agency it's it's yeah it's being I'm I'm being self responsible I'm owning this container that I'm creating but then the rest is up to you and I just have to trust that, you know, I'm doing the right thing and the best the best that I can be doing in any given moment. Um, I can imagine for new yoga teachers, it's overwhelming. That's what's so beautiful about it. That, that yoga, that for me, I would just say teaching yoga is doing yoga, is practicing yoga. And and it's like an, oppor- it's an opportunity to look at myself and to have humility, like you mentioned humility before. It's like, I often think that If I had to summarize all the yoga teachings in one word, that would be the word, you know, humility. (laughs) And it's, it's a really hard one. It's a hard one to swallow because I think that it goes against, at least in the West, what we're so often trained to do, right? Which is to make something of ourselves, to be, to have this identity and a name and all that. And yoga is like doing all that. And it's so, so I can relate to it through humility. And I would say it's so hard to, to be a teacher, but if you can see it as a practice of humility and service, uh, it's the best, it's, it's, it becomes yoga. It's a way to do the, to practice. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How beautiful is that? And Mm -hmm. shouldn't, shouldn't the way we teach yoga actually be aligned with the teachings themselves? Yeah. Well, I mean, it comes back to living yoga, like our behavior and our way of communicating and being and engaging with the world in the outward sense is obviously directly going to influence that inward experience. That's true. I would say it's hard. that is too hard for me. Like <laughs> not good enough to practice yoga in my whole life. Like I really, I mean, honestly, like I have been married for to my husband for th- I think 31 years and we have two grown children and I've failed so many times. But I would just say that at least, and I failed in teaching, but at least teaching for me is like such a clear, concise place where I can try to practice. Well, we are householders after all. So, yeah. you know, yeah, things exactly. have got to be, be real. So this probably very sweetly moves into the C of the ABC. So collaboration, which we, in some way we've kind of indirectly spoken to. But did you want to share anything about collaboration? Because I really enjoyed reading your word, words about collaboration and community in the book. Yeah. I would just say like how much, how grateful I am to my students for all they've shared with me and they just shown me over the years like that they know as much as I do and that, yeah, maybe I've studied a little more, but like they have so much insight into themselves, into the world and like, yes, I, I feel that, I feel, I feel like my respect for them makes collaboration possible and 
that's, you know, I think that's really what I'm trying to get to is like um, a mutually respectful relationship. On, on a very basic level, collaboration could be, you know, someone who is struggling with a pose or with a practice. And either I see that there's a struggle there or they tell me and I can make a suggestion and then they can kind of like try that. You know, and it's like, that's the collaborative approach of teaching. It's very, it's very basic. It's, I don't think it's so intellectual. It's just like, it's kind of natural. Does that make sense? Yeah, but something that really stood out for me as you talked about community in the book, it took me back to experiences that I've had facilitating retreats. Um, and the most recent one, obviously having young children, I don't run them near as much now, but I took a group to Greece last year. Um, and I'm taking a group to India this year. And every time I host, facilitate a retreat, it's such a joy to kind of almost erase myself and see the collaboration and the connection between everybody. It almost feels like everybody is absolutely destined to be there in the moment. And particularly maybe because it's the more recent one when I took a group to Greece last year, but just, and those connections, those bonds have stayed. And I think how incredible that I could just merely facilitate this experience where all these, this group of people have deep connection. And I'm just like witnessing that. And it just feels su su such a profound gift. It really is. I love that. I love it. I, every yoga class feels like that to me. It's like a way of bringing people together. And I, I do talk about that in the book. Yeah. The importance of community, because I think that, I mean, I talk about it a lot because the communities that I serve and that accessible yoga is kind of identified with, which is maybe uh, disabled people and older people who might have more isolation. But I would say this is actually true for all of us, that isolation is a huge issue in our lives. And I think yoga is a communal experience, even though it's a personal practice and there's some real interesting tension there too, like why you know why is that but there's something so beautiful about what you described and I've seen it happen I remember I always think of this one moment actually of uh, I was starting a class and um, one of the regular students wasn't there and another student asked me um, why isn't so-and-so here today and they were worried like they're really worried about them I can't remember if they had been sick or they were older or something and they were really concerned and I said you know I don't know because it's like I you know as a I try to have boundaries. So like, yeah, I you're not going to be tracking your students. <laughs> so that other student said, well, I have their number. So they just called them. Like class was literally about to start and they called them on the phone and they're like, where, where, where are you? Why aren't you here? You know, I just thought that's so amazing. Like I couldn't as a teacher do that. I couldn't just call somebody like, why aren't you here in class? But they could do that for each other. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. You know, the community they they formed. And so often I've seen that, like you described around the retreats, but ongoing classes I've had classes go on for I think there was one that was 12 13 years one group mostly started with people with AIDS a lot of the people in the group actually died but a lot of them survived and the group grew and, it, and kind of changed over the years but it became it was very cohesive and they became just incredibly almost like family honestly it was incredible mm, so heartwarming I love that I still think of them all the time yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, and it's such a gift. I think that uh, it goes back to what you were saying before about when as yoga teachers, if we're anchored in humility and service and just witnessing and allowing this all to unfold, it is truly a delight when we can get out of the struggle of, and the struggles are real, like as a yoga teacher, getting enough income and, and paying the bills yeah. and getting enough classes, like it's not denying that. But when you have the great blessing of being in a circumstance where you have some security and stability and you can allow for that. And again, you mentioned this in the book, you know, um, maybe you're teaching for free because, you know, you're retired or you've got the capacity to, you've got another source of income. I mean, you know, and I understand for some people that's not possible and they are relying on their income as a yoga teacher. And that unfortunately has drives them to potentially teach and do things in a way they wouldn't love to. Um, but even if you can have a glimpse of these experiences, it, it's a profound gift and a, and a privilege definitely to be teaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and then there's an irony there too. I think there's just some irony there because I have found that those are the classes that were more sustainable financially. Like those are the ones that actually uh, people came to and grew because they were community they were students come back for each other they don't come back for me 
you know, that was something I, I could see very clearly. <laughs> you know they come back to see their yoga friends I would say that and it's so amazing that that happens mm -hmm. I, I would just say I just want to give some I don't know what the word is like I don't want to advice but just for for newer teachers to not worry I think I think just to trust like the way you described Greece very quickly like your retreat there I think you you said something that really touched me which is that you trusted that everyone was there in the right place kind of at the right time and I, I feel the same way with every yoga class that I teach like this isn't about me and I think it's hard as a new teacher to get over that there's so much insecurity and um, imposter syndrome and I like I say in the book there's some truth to imposter syndrome which is that we don't know and we don't have to know like it's not and it's, it's not about us like you're just holding the space you're sharing some teachings that you learned and you're creating a space that's hopefully safe as can be and supporting people in their own journey that you're just barely even conscious of. Like, I don't know, I don't know what people need exactly, but I'm just gonna trust my intuition and share what I feel in my heart and trust that it will be useful for people who are coming. And I just think that it's such a big hurdle for newer teachers to get over that you know, to get to the place of trusting themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we are, and I say this a lot, we are merely the vessel for yeah. things to come through. Nothing more than that. Um, yeah, I mean, that goes back to service, right? So to be, to be of service is to, to, to act with love and out of love. And that's all we have to do. So there are no doubt, many facets to accessible yoga, which we could talk all day about. And I wonder if something stood out for me and this, I feel like almost ties in indirectly to what we were just talking about with new teachers. And that is um, financial accessibility alongside financial ethics. And then sort of beyond that, um, you know, money and finances are often a bit of an uncomfortable kind of subject in spiritual context and circles, perhaps, let's say, but I feel you would do address this really succinctly and well in the book. Um, but more specifically also, I, I'd love to know your thoughts and experience in navigating that balance of giving back to communities of the source culture of yoga versus the white savior complex. Like how can we get this right? If we have a really genuine desire to support and give back, but we don't want to fall into you know, that, that, that complex. So it, it, it's like you have this strong desire to, to do the right thing. And I think that that probably is the answer if you're, if that, if your heart's in it, but um, yeah. So do you want to speak to financial accessibility firstly, and therefore ethics, and then maybe speak more specifically to, yeah, giving back and yeah. Yeah. That's very, wow. There's a lot of good questions in there. I would say one thing that comes to mind is that Part of um, when we talked about the ethics of yoga and the ethics, how ethics leads to accessibility, one of the one of the um, yamas is um, well, actually, we could think of two of them. We could think about asteya, non-stealing, but also aparigraha, mm -hmm. of not hoarding. I would say that to me, um, making yoga accessible is is doing that. So is is sharing. Like to me, those the, the the response to those to especially parigraha is to share the teachings. And so, how can I share the teachings in a way that is accessible financially for people? Is a huge maybe the first question about making yoga accessible is like, is it financially accessible for someone? And I I would say for me, what I found over the years is that most most of my classes weren't in studios. Like I actually owned a, owned a yoga studio for a while, but I don't think that yoga studio culture is ne necessarily the place for the classes and the communities that I wanted to reach. And so I would often go into hospitals and community centers and share yoga there. And I also found over the years that I think the other part of this question about not, no, white saviorism is just such an important point because I think you know, as a white person, it's almost like my, the, the way that racism is embodied in me is this idea that I, I, I'm the one to fix the problem, that I have the answers. And I think what I, what I try to change that to in my mind is that actually what I can do is just 
share what I've learned. So I can give people access to these resources that I have access to. And so that could be, um, well, for example, Accessible Yoga as an organization started when I, I found that my disabled students who I was teaching in the community weren't taking the 200 hour trainings that I was leading. I, I had gotten almost full-time work leading 200 hour trainings and my students didn't want to come. And I was like, why, you know, why don't, and, and they would literally say, it's not accessible to me. It's too expensive. I can't get up the stairs. I can't do those hours. And so I started using the name accessible yoga around 2007, 2008 to run a 200 hour training for disabled people to become yoga teachers. Cause I thought there's a way I could just give them direct access to the teachings and then they can become the teacher instead of me. And I think that maybe is the answer. That's, that's what I've always tried to do in terms of um, also acknowledging the source culture of trying to give opportunities to South Asian teachers that I know and create, like, again, just share the resources I have access to. You know, as a gay white man, I think I'm, it's interesting because I have a lot of resources at my disposal. And then I also see sometimes that I don't. I mean, I think just there's there's still homophobia in the world. And I've seen times where it comes up, but I have a lot of access. And so I try to share that as much as I can. Platforming teachers um, who just don't and training them, giving them the seat of teacher, literally giving them job opportunities. So like, I can't tell you how many times like people come to me and offer me things. I mean, I'm very lucky that way. And I'd like to be here today. I could have said no to you, <laughs> maybe I should have, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and, uh, but like, I will often refer out to like someone else and be like, well, actually, I think I know someone else who could do this better. Mm. Anyway, there's a few answers to very complicated questions. Mm. I don't know if that's cool. It is, and there's nuance to everything. You know, sometimes I think, and you gave an example of this again in the book. It's like, do you give full scholarships? Do you give partial scholarships? And sometimes I think partial scholarships can be actually healthy and helpful because if someone actually puts something financial on the table, they're more likely to show up because they also have invested. It's like you're meeting in the middle, but then you don't want people to miss out if they literally can't do that. And it's tricky. And I think each individual uh, individual circumstances obviously needs individualized consideration perhaps. Yeah. I mean, we need structural change. I think we need um, we need a revolution. Honestly, like I just think to to put yoga in the context of capitalism is is illogical. And so, one of the things I, I often think of is that the yoga is free. And maybe I said this in the book: the yoga is free. I do not charge for yoga. It's literally just charging for time with me, or for the space that I have to rent, or whatever it is that I'm doing, like my internet connection and my electricity bill, that's what I feel like people are paying for because I just, I can't charge for something that is not mine. Um, I have to give that freely, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's an incredible reframe actually. I, I also would say in terms of structural change, I, I really would encourage people to consider structural changes in terms of the way they run their classes. Like I, I actually found that the most successful classes I ran were when I could get a third party to pay. So if I was teaching in a hospital, I would try and get the hospital, to, you know, there's a lot of like wellness programs in hospitals and stuff. So I would get them to pay me. And then the students either had lower cost or by donation or free class. And that was amazing because I no longer relied on how many people were there or something. I could get like a flat rate from this organization mm -hmm. those are the most sustainable and actually the easiest classes to deal with the financial tension that comes up oh and then one other thing that i would say is that when you are getting paid i think it's important to to not disregard that but to really honor the payment that you're getting and to consider that when you're giving back to the student that you don't need anything else from them because that boundaries going back to the B, the ABCs, the boundaries word. One of the issues I think with boundaries is that we look to the student to fulfill us in some way, either to, to come back to our classes or to say we did a good job or whatever it is. And actually, if you recognize that, well, what you're getting is payment often from them, then you cannot ask for anything more. You don't need anything more. And just 
except for respect. I mean, we do need safety and respect, but I'm just saying they're giving you money and then you give them this whatever instruction that you can. Mm -hmm. That's a clear boundary for me as well mm. with finances. Yeah. Well, there's already been an exchange that's taken place. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. It's really helpful. Yeah. I think it's, it's definitely a, a challenging consideration because we live in a capitalist society. Like it's like as yoga teachers, we need to function in this kind of world, but then we also want to have integrity with what we're doing and sharing and how we are giving back. Uh, you know, and, and I think that when it comes to when I was reading about that white savior complex in your book and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, if we're donating a percentage of our, what we earn, say from a, a course or a teacher training program, like, does that fall into it? Because I'm, I'm taking a chunk and giving it back. And therefore I think I've done something and I feel superior or is it actually a good thing? Cause I, I feel in my heart that feels really good. Like, I, I don't know. And I, and I, I personally started to question my thoughts and my choices. And I was like, oh my goodness. Am I but then maybe I'm just overthinking it. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think it's great to think it, to overthink it. Honestly, like we don't think about it enough. You know, I think white saviorism and the white savior complex is something that all white people should reflect on. It's just another aspect of racism. And it's something that I think that it, it's like so immersed in our, in the way we've been trained and um, like the water we're swimming in that we don't often recognize it. And we don't see the way that for example, we listen to white men or white people more than people of color. Like just the, the attention or the energy, or the, the, I don't know what it is. It's like a respect even that um, is given culturally to, to whiteness, I think is, it, it's another kind of power. We have, there's so much about power. I think when you look at understanding racism and the roles that we play, and I think it's important to really spend time reflecting on what is my position, like positionality and for all of us, meaning where are the places in my life that I have power and privilege and where are the places that I don't. And we all have very complex identities. Like I said, as a gay man, there's times I don't have power, but as a white man, there's times I have a lot. And so I think it's really important to do that. I, I talk about that quite a bit in my book, Yoga Revolution, which was the previous one. I think that's a core part of a spiritual practice is starting to identify how we move through the world to the best of our ability. And that depends so much on our experience because I, I, I don't think that the application of the yoga teachings so much depends on that actually. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I actually think that you can't, you know, you know how like, specific yoga teachings can be you know how like each of us has the right teachings and the right combination of them for our for everything about us who we are physically and also where we are in our lives and i think so much of that story plays into that of like this the trauma we experience and the identity we hold and i and i recognize that there's tension there because we always we often go to this like oneness you know <laughs> But it's like, you can't just go there. You have to recognize first the reality that you're living in. Um, and then through that exploration, I think we can start to reveal the places that we're connected. Uh, does that make sense? Mm, yeah, no, definitely. I suppose without going into too much of a, a wormhole, because um, I'm mindful of your time, but I, yeah, sometimes I feel, and, in, in, and I'm obviously just speaking from my personal experience and in a conflict because I do see folks from the South Asian community and there's an encouragement to give back to that source culture. But then at the same time, there's other folks from the South Asian community that say, well, we don't want handouts. Like we're, we want to feel self-responsible. And, and to me, that also seems like, okay, part of that white savior complex. And so it's about like trying to get it right. And obviously we can't please everybody all the time, but um, when the desire is there because you're recognizing the teachings and the source of the teachings, you're recognizing you're in a capitalist society. I don't know. I just, I th and I, I don't have an answer. I, I, I'm not sure anybody has, there's no one answer, but I, I do find that, um, that there's almost like a conflict there. And therefore there's a bit of personal inner confusion as to like, what is the best, best way forward. And maybe it's a situation of, okay, don't send money, don't donate money to a, an organization in India or something, but maybe 
you're supporting people in what you've suggested, scholarships for those people in the South Asian community. So you're just allowing them to have access to what you have access to or something. I don't know. I'm sorry, that's a bit of a mess, but. Oh, it's great. I mean, it's, I think that it's a really important journey for each of us, especially when you start to have like, resources like here you have the resource of a podcast so it's like I'm, and I didn't look but I mean I, I imagine that you've included a lot of South Asian voices and I think that's that's the key is just to be to be sharing the resources you have with that community in particular because if we're talking about yoga it comes from South Asia and we need to continually acknowledge that and offer gratitude there isn't one way to do that there's not one right way it depends on you and what you what works for you I would say part part of it to me is accessibility. Actually, going back to that idea, like that to me, it's it's generously sharing these teachings is a way to give back. Like I actually would say that if if we hold these teachings as exclusive exclusive and and like rebrand them or make them special for only a certain group of people, I think that's a kind of a hoarding you know, mentality. And so to me, it goes back to ethics. Are you sharing freely? Are you, and then not stealing. I think that's the other one. Astea, is it like actually um, acknowledging the source? Mm -hmm. Like I said before. Yeah. Humbly acknowledging the source without putting yourself down. Saying, yeah, I learned this from this teacher. I, To me, the place that I get stuck, if you want to hear my concern, <laughs> if you want to hear mine. Yes, please. Um, is that I think part of, the conversation around cultural appropriation is that, you know, is this honestly sharing the source, like saying, okay, I learned this from so-and-so because you learned it from someone else. Like I would say it kind of drives me crazy. I see it more kind of in like new age spirituality where some, someone's teaching something and I'm like, you know what, that comes directly from the, like, I know, oh, I heard some teacher say that, or I, that's from the Gita or that's from, you know what I mean? Like, it's so frustrating Maybe that maybe people are having like parallel experiences of like wisdom arising, but there's some like really big names out there, New Ageism. And I'm like, you're basically just teaching yoga and you should acknowledge that. But then there's the abuse piece. So personally, you know, my teacher is Swami Satchitananda, and I say that, but I also hesitate to say that because he was abusive. He was he was having sex with many of his students, and I didn't know at the time. And once I found out, then and it really dawned on me that I had to separate myself from the organization. Now I want to acknowledge him, but do I, do I want to say the name of an abuser? So I feel like there's tension there for me a lot. Cause I like to, a lot of the teachings that I have, the way I think of them are from him and are his words. And, and I want, I want to be honest about that, but I also don't want to constantly reference him. Yeah, and, and that I can appreciate that. And it's almost like you can see his humanness and that everybody in human form has a potential to fall from grace, possibly. And but yet you want to obviously respect the source. And 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 you know, a lot of people say it's not about the teacher, it's about the teachings, but at the same time, part of that acknowledgement is actually saying, Well, I got this from this person or this right. lineage and um yeah, it's so tricky, but I really appreciate your, your insight. It helps a lot. I would, and I would just give that challenge to other yoga teachers and other lineages where there's abuse. Because I, I just had this conversation online with someone the other day. They were talking about Patabi Joyce as one of their teachers. And I just said, you know, I wouldn't use his name. Like, I just wouldn't say his name. He was so abusive. There's no debating what he did. He was incredibly abusive. So how do we talk about the teachings that he gave? And I just think we got to find, same with Kundalini Yoga. And Yogi Bhajan, he was incredibly abusive. So I think people from those lineages like mine um, and many others, unfortunately, where there's yeah. abuse, you've got to find a new way. You know, I, I go back to the source teachings as best as I can. I look at the sutras or the Gita, you know, any, anywhere I can find something maybe a little earlier. And I recognize, like you said, they, they're human. And actually, they were just teaching something they learned. Mm -hmm. I don't think many of these people really created something very new. I think they were kind of maybe an interpretation, but these teachings were around way before them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I even think like Bikram came to mind when you were kind of yeah, calling exactly. out different schools. But but I also think Bikram. like 
he, he what he taught or what he does teach I should say um has totally come from his teachers and maybe maybe we reference our the teacher's teacher I don't know because if I mean who knows what they've done we we never know like those teachers may have fallen from grace but we we ne- we just don't know but at least if we can mention if we have that thread we can speak to a person you know that's um came before them maybe that might be sort of some way around mentioning the lineage without mentioning that specific teacher you know we speak to krishna macharya i, I don't know i don't know it, it seems messy and complex but i, I, would, I like recently i'm acknowledging the the i shared about this online the other day the this unbroken thread of, of practitioners and teachers who are unknown i think the unknown ones are really calling to me i i because i realized the other day all these names that were talking about all these people have only been around for the last century or so and like how much older is yoga than that you know literally like we're talking thousands of years so how who was doing it I mean even if you say Patanjali like who is that really and then like how did the you know who was practicing and doing all these things over just eons with no acknowledgement at all Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I love the fact in the yoga tradition oftentimes a, a practitioner would use their teacher's name. Part of the confusion with Patanjali and I think with a lot of other people, like I talk a lot about um, Ashtavakra, who is a great sage in yoga, who's a disabled person actually, and an amazing masterful teacher who was uh, the teacher of King Janaka. But there is the Ashtavakra Gita that was written probably a few hundred years after he probably died. This actual, because I think it was a real person and they'd say that Gita was much, his Gita, I'm talking about Ashtavakra, Ashtavakra Gita was much later, but there was this tradition of like, of naming something for your teacher. And so like you would write it in their name as like a way to honor them. Hmm. That's touching to me too, right? Like people that are just so humble that they literally don't even put their name on something. They, they put their teacher's name. You know, I just think it's so pretty, it's so beautiful. It's so, like I said, humility. That's the key, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I love all of that. It's just beautiful. And even, yeah, recognizing the unknown that have been before us, I think is is very powerful, especially if we, I think a lot of yoga teachers these days feel a bit lost um, because they don't feel connected to a specific lineage or they feel like they should be connected to a specific lineage. But at the same time, I think there's so much room for in- inquiry around, well, the, the yoga that I'm doing, the yoga that I'm learning, practicing, et cetera, like what is the source of this? Because a lot of people do study the sutras, which have relevance to us as practitioners and, and living yoga, but also like yoga today has been very heavily informed by not only Hatha yoga, but Tantra because Tantra informed Hatha yoga. So can we, instead of being attached too much to a specific teacher, guru, lineage, etc., maybe like honor that thread and go back you know, in time through the, the teachings themselves. And that might be maybe more fruitful. Yeah. Cause I also mm-hmm. say, I think this, I, this, this focus on the teacher, I, I get that people think it's traditional in terms of the guru disciple relationship, but I actually think a lot of it is influenced by Western individuality culture, which I don't think has been around through the history of yoga. I think this like obsession with this individual self is it's contrary to yoga teachings in a sense. And I think we're so immersed in that, that we don't see what we're doing. So many, uh, inc- I'll just speak for myself. The fact that I'm going to die is, is something that I personally think about a lot and it's painful. And I get, and I think being at peace with that reality that I'm going to die, that I'm, that I'm totally replaceable, that, you know, that like, that in the end, it's not that it's not that I don't matter, but it's just like I'm just a blip in this incredible expanse. And I I think that's an important practice to just see how small we are on the one hand. Um, and I don't mean to make anyone feel bad. We're also immense, but maybe that's how we find it. You know, maybe letting go of some of the obsessive kind of ego-driven identity stuff of like being recognized and making you know I don't know making an impact and having a following and whatever it is that we think we need to do I think is just garbage in the end honestly Mm -hmm. it's actually distracting and destructive in terms of a yoga practice ironically yeah Yeah. and consumes our time that we could be spent 
you know, doing different things, definitely. And it's tricky, though, because that's how society is is evolving. But something I'm sure you've experienced, given the number of years you've been teaching, um, and this is what I say to a lot of teachers who do mentoring with me, I'm like, remember, if you sincerely want to be doing this for your entire life, you really feel like this is your dharma, then just let it, like, let things go because I want you to see yourself as like 70 years of age sharing in your local community. Like if this is your dharma, like let go, like just surrender the Instagram following, surrender all these things and just, just be with your students and, and yeah, connect with the teachings. Yeah. Those are the teachers. I also want to acknowledge that rather than focusing on like the big names, I like to acknowledge the teachers who are actually doing service in their communities. Like I think those are the people who need to be celebrated the ones who are like on the ground in the classroom teaching, not spending their time talking about it. Like we are, <laughs> yeah, I do, or even writing about it, but actually just teaching. It's just remarkable. And they're the ones that need to be applauded and, and lifted up. And so if any teachers out there listening, I appreciate you, honestly, like I just feel so grateful to people who are actually out there teaching yoga instead of just posting about it. Yes, the pursuit of the online status it doesn't really trump just being on the ground and forgetting the online world and just being more traditional in how you're teaching, which is just teaching yoga, like to human yeah. beings. It's beautiful. Yeah, but I love what you said. I'm going to take that to heart. I mean, I'm, I'm in my late 50s, so it's like I can see 70 coming soon. It's like, you know, to just what, a, what an amazing gift I've had in my life to be able to share and practice and you know, I don't usually know what I'm doing, but I just feel like I just kind of follow where I'm led. Like it just kind of falls into place. I struggle like so much chaos in my head, but in the end, I, I also trust in my heart that um, it all kind of unfolds. Mm -hmm. how, it's meant to be, how it's meant to. Yeah. So Jivana, in closing, I'd love to touch on your upcoming online accessible yoga course in October, 2024. Can you tell us just a little bit about that before we wrap up? Yeah, if anyone's still around listening after all this, because <laughs> it's a long one, but I appreciate it. I appreciate anyone who's still listening. I would say, yeah, I'm teaching um, online accessible yoga training. It's kind of the core training that I do, a 40 hour course that's mostly live online, some pre-recorded. It's, it's, it's a great course because it's like, a lot of it is asana based, of course, that's what, you know, we're still teaching a lot of asana. And so it's about adapting asana, teaching integrated classes where people are in a chair and on the mat at the same time. And also so many other aspects of accessibility, like we started to touch on today that we get to talk about yoga for specific populations, like trans and queer issues, neurodiversity, things like that, trauma-informed teaching. I just love it. It's like a little bit of a survey of, of the world of accessibility and, um, and I'm doing them in person occasionally too now so that you can find find it on accessibleyogaschool.com or jivanaheyman.com. People can find about Great. me or on, online. I share at, on um, Instagram a lot too, as mm -hmm. you probably know. Yeah. Yes, I follow you. Yeah, we'll link up everything in, in the show notes for the listeners, but okay. the course sounds really enriching. Um, and of course, you have three published books with a fourth one coming that you're working on. <laughs> Um, yes. so that's really exciting. And there is whispers of a potential visit to Australia potentially, because I know there's a lot of Australians listening in as well. So a lot to look yeah, forward to. Next, that would be, yeah, that would be sometime. I hope if it works out in 2025, I was supposed to come to Australia and then COVID happened. And so, um, it got all canceled, but maybe I'd love to. Fingers crossed. There have been, yeah. Sounds great. Well, I will let you go. Thank you so much for such an enriching conversation and sharing your insight into this incredible world of accessible yoga, which is really yoga in itself, really, um, as you've highlighted and just incredibly appreciative for the work that you're doing in our community. So thank you so much for your time. I want to thank you, actually. I just want to say that, you know, I, did, I do a lot of these and I just appreciate your thoughtfulness and your great questions and the fact that you actually read the book and you really thought it through and that you, you struggle with these same questions as me. So I just, you know, I just want to say that um, I think that just means a lot to me, that time and energy you put into this. And 
And for, I think all your listeners probably recognize that too. And that's why they're here as they, you know, acknowledge and can see that in your, in the way you share yoga. So thank you. If this episode was of value to you and your life, please subscribe. And if you can think of someone who would benefit from this dialogue, please do them a favor and send it their way. If you feel called, hop on over to iTunes and leave a five-star review. This is the best way to get these conversations into the ears and hearts of our wider community, to those who need it most. You can find me at amyelandry.com or over on Instagram at amyelandry. May we all move a little closer to a life living in alignment.